So yeah, while we're waiting for the slides to go up, I'm Jim Gush, I'm a Deloitte Consulting. So I'm a PNC X-ray by training. Uh, I became an X-ray because I wanted to be a data scientist, although that vocabulary didn't exist back then. I became a data scientist, so now my title is Chief Data Scientist for Deloitte Consulting in the US, which means I'm old, they know what else to do with me. Um, and I'm here to talk about data science, but really it's kind of weird. I'm here to talk about sort of the limits of data science, because uh, more recently I've gotten interested in behavioral economics and the application of behavioral economics, uh, choice architecture and, and behavioral nudge theory. I've been a little surprised we haven't heard more about behavioral nudge today. Um, I've been thinking about behavioral economics for a long time because I've built a lot of models that experts, for example, underwriters use to make better underwriting decisions. Maps onto Moneyball perfectly, right? It's like instead of using gut feel, system one heuristics to make, to make decisions, you'll do a better job if you use you know, careful assessment of evidence. So it's not necessarily big data, but it's just like the right data. And so that's kind of like a Daniel Kahneman kind of story, right? Underwriters have bounded rationality. We can use data to help underwriters make better underwriting decisions. But that's really only a fraction of behavioral economics, and that's kind of what I want to talk about. Um, yeah, so data science is a big deal. We've been hearing a lot about digital tech. Uh, you know, because of digital tech, because of Moore's law, we, we, we're swimming in all this behavioral data. I think uh, a couple of us have mentioned this earlier. A lot of this is behavioral data. We can predict things. We can measure things we couldn't measure before. We can predict things we haven't predicted before. Credit predicts who's going to crash their car. Lifestyle data predicts, you know, are you going to have lifestyle diseases, comorbidities, and so on. So big data is a big deal. And just a parenthetical comment, it's not always a big deal because of the volume, velocity, and variety, which is kind of the industry tagline. A lot of times it's a big deal because of that behavioral content. You know, they're, they're little digital breadcrumbs we cast off as we go about our quotidian digitally mediated lives, right? So that's, that's big data. But that's really, um, that's obviously not the whole story, you know, because there's a lot of white space in that slide. The, the other part of the story is choice architecture. So Rory Sutherland is an ad man. I, I like quoting him because he's so articulate. He's a very articulate advocate for the whole choice architecture paradigm. Uh, he calls behavioral, uh, behavioral nudges and choice architecture the overdue science. And his tagline is, many programs and services are designed not for the brains of humans, but of Vulcans. Thanks in large part to Daniel Kahneman and as many collaborators and pupils and acolytes, this can and will change. Right, so already you're kind of seeing the importance of bringing in a new par paradigm, because data science is about giving people the right information. Right? For much of my career, I've given underwriters the right information so they can make better underwriting choices, both in, in uh, PNC and also in life and, and health insurance. And that's great. In, in, a, in a business setting, that's exactly what you need. Right? In, in, in Moneyball, um, the Oakland days were able to win in an unfair game because the baseball scouts were using the right data, not just gut feel to make decisions. But really, choice architecture is almost a parallel development. Instead of trying to make people more rational, quote unquote rational in scare quotes, the way classical economics assumes. Let's just go with human psychology as a given and shape the choice environment around it to make it easier for people to make better decisions. So that's the overdue science. And my mantra to my data science colleagues, uh, both at Deloitte and beyond for the last four or five years, is that fusing that choice architecture uh, paradigm with traditional data science gives you a really synergistic um, a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts. So, that, that's, so there's no name for this, but I sometimes call it greater data science. We need a greater data science that contains other things other than just math and stats and machine learning. And by the way, ethics is also part of this, right? But, and, and you'll see where I'm going with this. So I, I, the way I first framed this, this little comment a few years ago was I said there's this last mile problem of data science. And I think people have alluded to this before. We don't care about algorithmic outputs, right? We care about better outcomes, right? Um, and intuitively, I think most data scientists and most technologists, most actuaries, they think in terms of classical economics when they build their tools. They, they, you know, they're, they're, thinking, they're, they're doing system two thinking on the job. And so intuitively, I think they, they kind of like assume tacitly that their customers are, are system two thinkers too. Because very often when, when people build models, they when we build models, the, the kind of implicit premise is we're going to use those models to either to give people information they didn't know before, you know, more precise information, more customized information, more targeted information, or we're going to give them economic incentives, right? So if, 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 I, if my model tells me that Paolo is an unsafe driver, which of course he is, I'm going to jack up his premium. That, that's classical economics, and that, that completely makes sense. I'm not trashing it. All I'm saying is that if you take a behavioral economics perspective, there are other ways of changing behavior other than just giving people information they didn't have before or giving them economic incentives. What we've discovered 
is that subtle tweaks in the environment, right, the way the choices are arranged, the way the information is communicated, can have surprisingly large impacts on people's behavior. So that's the kind of theme I'm, I'm repeating from my, 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 the people who are much greater than I am. I'll give you one parable example of, 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 of how we apply this at work. So the state of New Mexico, this is an insurance story. It's not retirement, but it's still an insurance story. The state of New Mexico has an unemployment insurance department. They hired, and, they, and they, they, all states have this problem that if someone is unemployed, they're supposed to log onto a portal every week and report how much earning they earned in the past week, right? So if I've been unemployed, I, you know, maybe I've been driving Uber on the side, I, and I, I, maybe I made $500, maybe I report 200. I just type in 200. If the state finds later on there's a discrepancy, you know, I was reporting 200, I really made 500, they try to go back and claw it back for me. So that's called pay and chase. And that's obviously very inefficient. So they hired some of my colleagues to build a machine learning algorithm to try to suss out in real time people who might be reporting earnings you know, not, not quite accurately. And we were brainstorming machine learning techniques to do this. And I very quickly changed the subject because I knew that no matter how good our classifier would be, no matter how good our segmentation power would be, if the overall base rate of fraud is, say, 5%, then people in the worst decile might have like a 30% chance of collecting benefits improperly instead of like a you know, 1 in 20 chance of collecting benefits improperly. Well, if that's the case, if you use that, the, if you use that model to cut off people's benefits, say, in the worst decile, two out of three times you'd be cutting off the benefits of people that should be getting those benefits. And so that's a real problem. So the model is valuable because it has huge segmentation power, right? If you're, if you're in decile 10, you have a one in three chance of, being, of collecting benefits properly as opposed to the overall base rate of one in 20. But how do you act on that information? The intuitive assumption is you should use it to cut off benefits or send out somebody to inspect or do some kind of classical, you know, broadly speaking, classical economics action, right? And in fact, in the middle of this project, we learned of another state that did precisely that. They built an algorithm. They used that algorithm to cut off people's benefits, and they ended up on the Rachel Maddow show. Oops. <laughs> so what, you know, the, the, the perspective here is that, you know, again, we're trying to drive a better outcome. We're trying to, we're trying to drive people, you know, we're trying to you know, avoid this problem of improper payments. So instead of trying to direct the model to, say, inspectors or people who can shut off benefits, why not use that algorithm to, to deliver in a targeted way behavioral nudge messages? Okay? And that's exactly what we did. We were inspired by some of Dan Ariely's stories and some of his popular books at first, and we went back to some of his papers. We tried all sorts of cute tricks. I mean, there's a, there's a story he tells about, you know, at MIT, he was, um, uh, he and Nina Mazar, who's at the University of Toronto, uh, were trying to do an experiment about what keeps students honest. And so they had a, a treatment group where they asked the students to re recite the MIT Oath of Honor before self-grading their exam. And then they shredded the exam and passed the results to the, to, to, to the instructor. And the people in the control group, they didn't recite any Oath of Honor. They also self-graded their exam, shredded the exam, gave the results in. And they found, but the shredder was actually broken. So, that, so, so Ariely could actually compare, uh, you know, <laughs> what the students actually did to what they reported. And then what they found was that the people who recited the MIT Oath of Honor were much more honest than people who didn't recite the MIT Oath of Honor, and, which is interesting. And the real joke is that there is no MIT Oath of Honor. He just made that up. <laughs> now, so that, that's Danny Early's TED lecture, which I just shamelessly stole. I didn't, I didn't plan on doing that. Interesting, this is, there's a meta story here. We tried that sort of thing. Um, not all the results replicated. So there is a replication crisis. And that's an example of priming, which is one of those uh, areas of social psych psychology that actually is not replicated. But we tried a lot of things. And one thing we tried that did work was, say I've been collecting benefits for the past four weeks. Every week I've logged on at nine in the morning, I earn blah, blah, blah. Then maybe in week five, I log on a Saturday afternoon and I log a higher amount, but maybe there's something suspicious about it. Maybe there's some other things that have triggered this, this risk suspicion score that we built, right? So I'm all of a sudden, I go from decile three to decile 10. All of a sudden, for the first time in five weeks, I see a little pop-up message saying, whoop, did you know that nine out of 10 of your neighbors in Bernalillo County report their earnings accurately? We didn't say honestly, we said accurately. And we did, again, an A-B test. We did a randomized control trial, and, we, and, and what we found was that that combination of of machine learning and behavioral nudges essentially cut the problem in half. It reduced, it reduced improper payments by half. So it was a huge effect size. This was written up by Pew Charitable Trust, if you don't believe me. Um, so that was um, about as good a water cooler story as I could have heard of. I was just hoping I wouldn't be embarrassed in front of my clients and colleagues, but it worked like gangbusters. So that kind of made me a believer. And by the way, that, that, the thing that did replicate for us um, it was exactly the same behavioral nudge that Richard Thaler famously suggested to the UK behavioral insights team, the nudge unit in the Cameron administration, they're trying to get their 
taxpayers to pay their taxes on time. Right? Thaler said, what are you doing now? They said, we sent a letter out. Thaler said, well, here's what you do. Add a line to the top of the letter saying, did you know that nine out of 10 of your neighbors in Westminster pay their taxes on time? Send out the original letter to half the population of Westminster, send out the modified letter to the other half, see what happens. They collected millions of pounds of additional revenue. So that really did replicate. That is not behavioral economics, by the way. That is psychology. Thaler said he got that from the Robert Cialdini Bible. That's his word. Robert Cialdini is a psychologist who wrote a book called Influence. And this is famously used by O Power. It's famously used to get people to use less electricity by comparing you to your neighbors, right? So on and so on. So there's a lot of untapped potential here. This is just scratching the surface, right? That very few people in the kind of digital world, in the behavioral, uh, or in the data science world are thinking in these terms. And where I'd like to go with this is that this is sort of a science that we can use to attack a fuzzier problem, which is customer centricity. I was actually talking to an insurance, a life insurance company a few weeks ago, the global leadership team, and I, I basically, I, I quoted their CEO who's sitting right there in the audience. I said, the CEO said, in, in a video that I found online, he said, we've become a truly customer centric company. And he, he really meant this, they really want this, right? This is a behind closed door meeting. We need to understand how our customers think, what their needs are, and make sure we understand it from their perspective. This, this resonates with a lot of comments this morning, doesn't it? Kozmin and others this morning. What I'd like to say is that, well, we have a science for how our customers think now. It's called behavioral finance. So a few years ago, I, I interviewed Richard Thaler for our in-house magazine, Deloitte Review, when Misbehaving came out, his memoirs. If you haven't read Misbehaving, it's extraordinarily entertaining. And I asked Thaler, just, can you summarize behavioral economics and what, you know, what's your consulting elevator speech for a busy Deloitte partner? And Thaler said this, economists assume that the people they study, so-called homo economicus, or what I call econs, are really smart. They know as much economics as the best economists. They make perfect forecasts. They have no self-control problems, and they're complete jerks. <laughs> They'll steal your money if they can get away with it. And most of the people I meet don't have any of those qualities. This is a guy teaching at the University of Chicago, so that's impressive. Kidding, my, my PhD is from Chicago. <laughs> they have trouble balancing their checkbook without a spreadsheet. They eat too much and they save too little. They leave it a tip at a restaurant even if they don't call plan on going back. He's summarizing what he calls the three bounds of behavioral economics. The first is bounded rationality, which I talked about earlier. The second is bounded self-control. I mean to rebalance my portfolio. Right? I got the right information from the robo-advisor. I got the right information from my human advisor. But when am I going to do it? After the next game of Game of Thrones. After the next episode is over, I'll do it. I'll do it tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes, I'll do it tomorrow. And tomorrow never comes. Right? So that's present bias. So there's bounded rationality, bounded self-control. There's also bounded self-interest. You will leave it a tip at a restaurant even if you don't plan on going back. If somebody gives you a free shoe shine, you probably give them more money than if they're paying for it. Bounded self-interest is why the um, New Mexico thing worked for us, right? People were economically worse off if they reported their earnings accurately, but people, it's not just that people are honest or dishonest, people follow the social norm, right? It's not like some people are metaphysically honest and some people are metaphysically dishonest. Everybody, all of us, are more or less likely to be honest or dishonest depending on how the environment is perceived, depending on the social norms. And we kind of tapped into that power of social norms in that, in, that, in that experiment. Sandy Pentland at MIT Media Lab calls this stuff social physics. And we're talking about, you know, how, how can you know, we get people to adopt these technologies? Well, it can be social physics, right? If, if, if a lot of your peers are doing it, you'll do it too. So um, this is extre extremely poignant in the case of retirement conversations. And this is a quote from, or a paraphrase from part of Nudge, the book that he wrote with Sunstein, because retirement savings decisions are fraught choices. And I think this is very really close to the comments made earlier. They're made infrequently, they require, they provide no immediate feedback, so it's not like getting an ice cream cone, right? Um, they require expert knowledge, and usually stuff is written in kind of Vulcan, not human. And the effects of your choice are, are experienced not by your present self, but by your future self. And this gets to, to Olivia's comment about you know, what if you could look at your 70-year-old self, right? Of course, my 70-year-old self will look just like me, but, you know. Um, uh, and and, and that, that, that's actually a behavioral nudge. That was Hal Hirschfield at UCLA. He created that, that tool to, to, you know, you help you visualize your future self so you can better empathize with your future self because your future self and your present self are different people, right? So, so, so we, we especially need choice architecture in this domain. And sort of the spin-off of Thaler's thinking about behavioral economics was this book, Nudge. And Thaler says there's not a lot of economics in Nudge. It really is psychology. And interestingly enough, um, I, I was kind of fell out of my chair when I read this in, in, in his book, Misbehaving. He got the idea from, for Nudge, not from you know, Daniel Kahneman. He, he, well, he had the ideas, but he said the organizing principle to, came when, when he reread Don Norman's classic book, The Design of Everyday Things. 
you know, he said, while Cass and I were capable of recognizing good nudges when we came across them, we were missing that organizing principle. We had a big break when I re reread Don Norman's book. So the idea is, let's take all these cute little cocktail party conversation things, you know, the things we, we hear about, about all, all our little kind of foibles, and, it's, and, and actually do something with it. Let's turn those into design principles, right? So instead of trying to reform people like we do with data science and try to make people more rational by giving them this optimal amount of information, let's just take people as they are and just change the landscape around them to make it natural. Rather than it be an uphill climb, let's make it a downhill climb. So let's write things in English. Here's a, here's a metaphor they use, which I sometimes use in these talks. Um, if you were visiting Cambodia for the first time and you sat down at a local restaurant, would you rather have the local menu with all the 50 choices written in Khmer, you know, with a lot of words you don't understand? Or would you rather have a tourist menu written in English with the five most popular choices that the tourists like you enjoyed in the past? What's, what's more likely to lead to a, a better lunch, right? Um, and Alex Lee here, could we use data about people to kind of like curate the right menu of choices? Not necessarily take away any choices, but you can like maybe have, you know, the, the main menu has the five choices, and you can click on more links if you want to see more choices. Call the call center if you want, if you want even more information. Um, so yeah, let's, let's use, so, so we we're, were talking about design before, we we're talking about user experience. Um, this is kind of designed for behavior change. This is human, in, in the same way that Don Norman talks about the designing objects to go with the grain of human psychology, let's design choice environments to go with the grain of, of human psychology. Uh, and I'll, I'll just, to give an example, just to make Don Norman, in case you haven't read Don Norman, I actually gave a talk with him last week, just coincidentally, which is kind of insane. And he's best known for the Norman door. The Norman door is a piece of technology, it's a door. And it's a door they have to push to get out of. But if there's a pull handle, even though you're supposed to push to get out of it, you always pull it. Right? I do this all the time, all of us do this all the time. So it needs a little instruction manual to go along with it. You, you know, there's a pull handle, but there's a little sign that says push. Even though the instruction manual's there, people always pull it to get out. Right? So that's a very simple bit of technology that you need an instruction manual to use. Don Norman actually left academia and he went to work at Apple back in the day. And you know, if you think about Apple products, just as an example, those are very complicated pieces of technology that actually I gave one to my elderly mother and she started using it to paint paintings with no instruction manual. She uses it right away and she's a technophobe. That's a very complicated piece of technology that's built to go with the grain of human psychology. That was actually the theme of that Steve Jobs movie, if anybody's seen it. So, so kind of being like Steve Jobs in a financial services company would be to kind of bring these kinds of behavioral design principles. So it's framed in terms of libertarian paternalism, but I think it's, easy, it's, it's more natural to frame this in terms of human-centered design, which is really another way of saying customer centricity, okay? Um, how much time do I have? I'm out of time? One minute. Okay. Smart defaults are the classic example. If you're automatically enrolled and given the choice to opt out, you're more likely to save. Um, that was done by Richard Thaler and his colleague Shlomo Benartzi. Um, Thaler won the Nobel Prize last fall, and Benartzi estimated that that's resulted in 30 billions of extra dollars um, being saved into retirement accounts. Benart there, there are a lot of robo advisors. This is Clink uh, by Feeney. Uh, Fe no, Clink's Feeney, financial genie, coming out of the University of Mich Michigan Computer Science Department. I'm very impressed by it. Natural language processing, artificial intelligence. It's an app. You can talk to it. Feeney, what's my bank account? Feeney, can I? You know, can I afford this meal? And it's sort of like a robo Susie Orman. It'll say, sure, <laughs> or denied. Um, and that's fine, but I feel like it's, th these guys are technologists, and again, they're not thinking in terms of the human-centered design. So they, they, they could be doing peer comparisons, they could be using smart defaults, they could be taking advantage of mental accounting, they could be A-B testing all these things the way we did in New Mexico. An example where this is being done, and I think this was alluded to earlier, is the Acorns app. And guess who the behavioral scientists behind the Acorns app are? Shlomo Benarzi and Hal Hirschfield, same people, okay? So, you know, what they try to do is they try to, you know, in the same way we can like, make, spend money with one click, they want you to be able to save money with one click. So if you buy that hipster, you know, $4.25 $4 cup of blue bottle coffee, when you really should be saving, it rounds up to $5 and you put the other 75 cents in your bank account. So you make it easy. And that's, that's the mantra of nudges. If you make it easy, if you change that landscape, people are more likely to do the right thing. Um, they, they try to use um, the smart screen, that's Benarzi's new book, um, to use data visualization and information visualization to help people intuit things that are hard to understand if you just, so it's not just what you tell them, it's how you tell it to them. So you can A-B test that. So you can actually visualize your current decisions and the effect they have on your future prosperity when you're older. And, and I call this Nudge 2.0, because it really, it, it really is, 
Now that we're in this digital environment, it's actually easier to change a digital environment than a physical environment. It's easier to change a digital environment than a piece of paper. We experience this in New Mexico. This is what people in Silicon Valley do all the time. They're running thousands of randomized control trials uh, a year. So some examples are, you know, change the, change the display to help people avoid thinking about short-term fluctuations in the market and think more in terms of long-term decision-making. I think that was a comment made earlier. You could use data to personalize the nudge messages, right? Maybe the language could be different. Maybe the kind of content you tell them could be different. And here's an example of A-B testing. You know, which option yields a higher update? Giving people the choice to save $5 a day, $35 a week, or $150 a month. It's an empirical question, which of those options would yield better savings behavior in people? Well, if you're in a digital environment, you've got you know, millions of customers or thousands of customers even, you can just A-B test that. And they found, just think to yourself, what's most likely? $5 a day was, was the most, uh, led to the best results. So I, I, th I call that nudge 2.0. You know, we can redesign our digital environments to go with a grain of human psychology. All right? Thank you, Jim. Sure.